Dr. Sandra Kaufman began her academic career in the field of cellu cellular biology, earning a master's degree from the University of Connecticut in tropical ecology and plant physiology, not plant psychology. <laughs> Turning to medicine, she received her medical degree at the University of Maryland and completed a residency and fellowship at Johns Hopkins in the field of pediatric anesthesiology. For the last five years, she's been the chief of pediatric anesthesia at the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital. Her, av yeah, her avid interest in the science of anti-aging began many years ago, utilizing her knowledge in cell biology, human pharmacology, and physiology. This hobby has now become a main focus. The Kaufman Protocol Project represents years of non-clinical research leading to the first ever comprehensive theory of aging. Her book is The Kaufman Protocol, Why We Age and How to Stop It. Please welcome Dr. Sandra Kaufman. Okay, number one, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, I learned about all of you people at RadFest, which was a tremendous experience. Uh, I see familiar faces because people came to my booth and we chatted and it was delightful. And I actually sold out and I am just so thrilled to be here. Um, anyway, so in fact what he said is correct. I am Dr. Kaufman of the Kaufman Protocol. Some of you guys are like, what the heck is that? And by the time I get done with this, you'll be like, oh, well of course that's what that is. So the book is called Why We Age and How to Stop It, which is probably kind of a dumb title, but it's exactly what it is. I couldn't find another word for it. Why do we age? I'm gonna tell you. How do you stop it? I got that too. So it's a very simple title. Um, I didn't realize I was gonna get that great bio introduction so we can skip this part. I was just gonna tell you who I am because you probably have no idea who I am. I'm a physician, I was a cell biologist, and much like you guys, I really don't wanna age. So what, I actually, so what I actually am, I'm kind of a bit of an adventurer. Um, and I realized many years ago that if I wanted to keep adventuring, I had to get rid of this nasty, pesky thing called aging, like all of us, right? I climb mountains, I swing from cliffs, my rock climbing partner is here. Uh, this is what I like to do, and I'm going to keep doing it. So what I did many years ago is I decided, well, to figure this out, I'm not a researcher, I don't have the scientific equipment, I got a brain, I got a library. So I started reading, and I read thousands and thousands and thousands of articles, and I read through every scientific reason that you could age, and I threw out the ones that seemed like ridiculous, and I took the ones that were reasonable, and I put them all together in what I think is a very comprehensive theory of aging. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted everyone to be able to understand it. Like speaking in scientific doctor lingo, people look at you like you've got three heads, right? So I wanted everyone to be able to understand this. So I came up with a model, and that's what I'm going to explain to you tonight. Interestingly enough, and this probably does not apply to you guys, when you say aging, people think it's Botox and it's laser and all that sort of thing, at least in Miami. So people assume that they know what I'm talking about before I open my mouth. And the reality is, I always start with what it isn't, so that then we can get down to like what it is. And so what it isn't, it's not diet, it's not exercise, it's not weight loss, it's not hormone therapy replacement, it's not any of those things. What is it? It is a comprehensive interpretation of cellular aging, which I know that's code for this is gonna be really long and boring, so I apologize for that up front. <laughs> the key, however, is the cellular aging part. You are made of cells and cell products. And that's what causes you to age. So we're going to talk about cells. Hope that's not too boring for you. Secondly, it's derived from real science. I'm not up here to tell you about yoga or colonic cleansing. This is real science. And I like to talk about the hierarchy of evidence. Everything in this presentation started with, is it working in a test tube? Does it work in a cell culture? Does it work in small animal models? Does it work in humans? Doop, 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 doop. So you'll see how that comes to play as I go along. Secondly, I talked about, we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about, unique factory model. You're going to understand what this means when I get there. Uh, and secondly, and most importantly, once you understand why you age, I'm going to tell you how to stop it. 
Uh, the other thing is that I tend to babble on a bit, and I've been given a time limit, so I'm going to skip over some stuff. So if you want me to tell you more, I'm happy to do it, but I also want to get through everything without losing people. All right. Uh, I usually talk about what aging is. You guys clearly know this. Most importantly, you start aging at the age of 30, and you keep going from there. People don't realize it until they're 35, 40, 45, but I like to tell people 30 is the age. You've got you to start worrying about it early. All right, so we're going to digress a bit. We're going to pretend like we own a factory. Why does a factory fall apart over time? Well, the first thing you need to know is, is what, what it needs to function. So the first thing a factory needs is the company operating manual, right? What does the company do? What are the directions? What widgets is it going to make? All those sort of written material that's very important. Secondly, every factory needs an energy source, coal, solar, whatever it's going to be. They need pathways, assembly lines, feedback loops. That's how factories work, right? Quality control. There's always some dude checking the widgets to make sure they're functional, right? There's security systems. There's the fat guy in the back checking IDs. There's the fence around it. Everything needs a, uh, needs a security system. Your workforce, that's your individual employees. And lastly, waste management, right? If you don't take out the garbage, your factory's not going to last. What does this mean to us? So your company operating manual, ooh, that didn't work out very well, did it? Ooh, got moved around. Quite sorry. They, they a mind that's lined up. Anyway, your company operating manual, that's your DNA. Everything that a company would need to make a widget, it's in your DNA. Your energy source is your mitochondria. Your pathways are aging pathways. I like to talk about the big three. There are others, but the big three. AMP kinase, your sirtuins, and your mTOR pathway. Quality control mechanisms. We, in fact, have DNA and protein repair mechanisms. Very important. We have security. All right, that's your immune system. We have a workforce. Those are your individual cells. And lastly, we have waste management. You've got to take out the garbage. So we're going to try to get through these, and I will try to get through them quickly. I don't want to bore everybody. Tenant one, DNA. Everyone here knows about DNA. You need to know what it looks like and how it's packaged, which leads us then to epigenetics and telomeres. Uh, assuming that people here know what DNA looks like, it is a spiral ladder, right? Uh, Watson and Creek in the 1950s. Um, when I went to med school, it was just genetics, right? You knew about genetics. Recently, we now know about epigenetics. And the question is, what is epigenetics? So epigenetics is the science of what happens to control DNA on top of the base pair pairings, OK? Uh, in a very simplistic view, and I love simplistic views because it's easy to understand, I like to think of lollipops being glued to the side of your DNA, right? If there's something stuck to the side of your DNA, you can't use that piece because they act as roadblocks. So I call them decorations, but really it's methylation. It's a methyl group glued to the side of your DNA. And that changes over time. The other thing you need to know is that your DNA is packaged. If you didn't package it well, it would be really kind of like a jumble of spaghetti, right? So the way DNA is packaged, it's wrapped around pieces called histones. Histones are subunits and a four by two matrix, blah, blah, blah. You don't need to know that. But it looks like Christmas lights. So you get a strand of DNA wrapped around histones, strand of DNA wrapped around histones. Bunched together, that's your DNA. And the way your body controls this is it decorates the histones much like we decorated the DNA. So you get phosphate groups, acetyl groups, methyl groups, all tagged onto that, and it controls what DNA gets processed. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. So then what's epigenetics? Why, what is this important, right? So Steve Horvath noticed that there is a reproducible way in which DNA gets methylated over time. It's the Horvath clock. Uh, I think it's 363 areas of your DNA. They either get hypo or hypermethylated. You look at ratios, it tells you how old you are. Um, that's pretty standard. Uh, epigenetic changes that are not standard is called epigenetic drift. And this is influenced by your lifestyle, what you eat, uh, what you do, bad things. Anything that your mom said is bad for you is probably an epigenetic modifier. Smoking, drinking, pollutants, that sort of thing. Foods that are good for you tend to be positive epigenetic modifiers. My favorite example of how food can affect this is the honeybee, which is why I got that fun little bee there. I don't know if you guys know this example. I love this. If you take all the larvae in a, in a bee colony, they all have identical DNA, absolutely identical. And they are all fed royal jelly. Over the course of time, only a few remain being fed royal jelly, and the rest are fed pollen and nectar. 
The food choice then determines their lifestyle. If they are fed royal jelly, they become queens. And if they're not, they become worker bees. Exactly identically, genetically identical, epigenetically modified to have a different role in life. So it's kind of cool. All right, telomeres. I'm trying to race through this, so if I'm going too quickly, please stop me. Okay, we all know what telomeres are, right? Okay, good, so we know what telomerase is, right? Skip. Okay, good. All right, so tenant two. Everything needs energy, right? Energy comes from the mitochondria. They're the powerhouse of the cell. Different cells have different numbers based on requirements. Uh, a liver cell has about 1,000 to 2,000 mitochondria. An oocyte has about 5,000 mitochondria. However, when an oocyte is ready to develop into a real egg to become a real person, it gets up to about a half a million mitochondria. So cells know how much energy they need and mitochondria respond accordingly. And in fact, one of the theories of menopause is that your oocytes run out of mitochondria, run out of energy, therefore the eggs give up and you're done. So theoretically, boosting your mitochondria can offset menopause, which is kind of cool. How does the mitochondrial function? Functions via the electron transport chain. It's kind of a really boring, dry subject, so I'm not gonna get into it. Most important thing to know is that it's a proton shuttle mechanism. The last receiver of the proton is oxygen, which is why you need oxygen. Turns into water, blah, 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 blah. Importantly here is that one to 5% of this oxygen becomes radicalized, right? We're all worried about free radical scavenging. This is where the free radicals come from. So mitochondria, are the biggest producers of free radicals and the biggest victims of free radicals, which led to the mitochondrial superoxide theory of aging. Of course, your body knows this, right? So it produces antioxidants to combat this problem. Of course, with time, anything good that we have in our body decreases, so we, uh, we need more. We lose SODs, we lose catalase, we lose glutathione, et cetera. We need more. If we don't have more, it destroys our DNA, lipids, and our proteins. Um, it's kind of a neat thing, Catalase deficiency in the hair is thought to cause gray hair. Um, so theoretically, if you could boost your catalase levels, you can, get, you can lose your gray hair. Uh, the other thing about mitochondria is one of the rate limiting substances is nicotinamide. Um, everyone knows nicotinamide is a big deal at Radfest, right? Why does anyone know why that's important? I'll tell you, just because you don't. And just in case you don't, rather. So your body needs it for four reasons. And the first one is right here. You need nicotinamide adenide, bleh, can't even speak, NAT, as a shuttle system in your mitochondria. Without nicotinamide, you can't make energy. That's why you're tired if you're nicotinamide deficient. As well, it is also a very necessary for communication via the oxphos ox system between the mitochondria and the nucleus. Uh, it is a necessary coenzyme for sirtuin activation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, as well, your body actually deconstructs it to put uh, pieces back into your DNA. So it's DNA repair. So without it, you're going to lose a whole lot of stuff. Uh, pathways. Am I zooming through this too quickly? I hate to. You're, you guys are good? Okay. So there are many aging pathways. As I said at the beginning, oh, you're so kind. Thank you. Um, I like to focus on the big three. We know about them from studies on caloric restriction. We know that skinny people do better than non-skinny people. Caloric restriction, by definition, is a 20 to 50% decline in uh, calorie intake without starving. And we know that increases uh, lifespan in many organisms. Uh, we'll skip quotes to save some time. All right, so sirtuins. Everyone knows about sirtuins, right? It's a silent information. No? All right, so I'll slow down here. Okay, so sirtuins, <laughs> might as well cater to the crowd, right? All right, so sirtuins is the uh, silent information regulator gene. It was discovered in the year 2000. It was noted that yeast, if it had an extra copy, lived 30% longer. Conversely, if they lost a copy, they lived a lot less. Uh, they are, in fact, nicotinamide uh, requiring. It's a necessary koan coenzyme for them to function, and they do extremely important things. They regulate the body's metabolic pathways, uh, they promote different protein uh, systems, they increase antioxidant uh, pathways, and they facilitate DNA repair. That's very brief. Even briefer, we have seven of them. There are fewer in other animals, we have seven. We know the most about one, because that's why it's named number one, right? Uh, it's located in the nucleus. 
What I think is really cool about this particular sirtuin is it controls circadian rhythms. So as you get older and you don't sleep very well, it's because you have a sirtuin deficiency. By boosting your sirtuins, you will sleep better. Um, does other things as well, but that list will be repetitive sort of in a second. Uh, two is sort of cool. Um, it controls uh, mitosis. So if you are, again, sirtuin deficient, you don't have cell division, and that leads to problems. Uh, three is, uh, is kind of cool. It makes uh, brown fat. I don't know if you guys know white fat versus brown fat. We all want brown fat, right? Because you burn calories without actually having to do anything. So that's kind of fun. Uh, four, five, and six, nothing too exciting. I do like six, though, because it uh, helps with your telomeres. And it also prevents diet-induced obesity, which is one of my favorite things, because I uh, guiltily am a junk food junkie. But as long as I keep my sirtuins intact, I can eat whatever the hell I want. <laughs> Confession, right? Uh, seven I threw on there because I had to, but I couldn't come up with anything else clever to put on the slides, so we're just going to skip that. So sirtuins, what happens with sirtuins? They're phenomenal. Unfortunately, everything good goes down with time. So our sirtuins go down in time. As well, the nicotinamide goes down with time, so it's a double whammy. Um, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna activate our sirtuins, and we're gonna take more nicotinamide. Uh, the next pathway, AMP kinase. You guys know about this one? Okay, it is the adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase pathway. That's kind of a big mouth, big, uh, big word. AMP is the opposite of ATP, so you've probably heard of it. ATP is energy, right? AMP and ATP shuttle phosphates back and forth. So if you have more AMP, you're energy deficient. So this system controls your energy. So if you have high amounts of AMP, your body's like going, oh my goodness, I need to find more energy. What's it gonna do? So to increase ATP production, it looks for glucose. It puts glucose in your cells and it finds it in other places. It breaks down fat goes everywhere it can possibly do, go to, to make more energy. The other really cool thing it does is it increases um, mitochondrial turnover. Recycling, right? If you had an energy car, or if you had a car that didn't have good energy output, you would get a new one that was more energy efficient, right? It's the same deal with mitochondria. You get rid of the old mitochondria, you get a brand new shiny one, more energy efficient, happens with AMP kinase. Uh, the other thing it does is it gets rid of things that suck up energy. So you don't make anything. You decrease fatty acid synthesis, steroids, glucose, proteins. Basically, your cells go into hibernation until the energy levels return. So what happens when you don't have AMP kinase? Uh, not so great things, right? Decrease in autophagy, which is the cell turnover, oxidative stress, inflammation, get more fat, that's never good. Hyperglycemic, et cetera. Nothing's good with this. But can we activate it? Of course we can. mTOR, you guys know about the mTOR pathway? All right, so we're going to skip this. You know about this? No, people say no. Okay. Because <laughs> you, you guys want to know what I'm going to say about rapamycin, right? That's where we're going with this? You can feel that in the air, right? Okay, so mTOR, mTOR is the mechanism target of rapamycin. It was discovered, rapamycin, on Easter Island in the 1970s in a soil, bleh, in a dirt sample. Uh, it does exactly the same things that the other one does, but responds backwards. This is a building system. I call it the youthful pathway. When you are young and you need unbridled growth, this is what it does. Unfortunately, as cells get older and they get kind of grumpy and they don't function as well, if you activate the mTOR pathway, things become hyperactive in a bad way. For example, if the smooth muscle cells in your arteries, if they become overstimulated with mTOR, you get high blood pressure. If you activate osteoclasts in your bones, you get osteoporosis. You do it with platelets and you become hypercoagulable and you're more likely to stroke. Things that just are not good, right? So over time, this pathway becomes obsolescent. Therefore, blocking it could be a really good thing, right? That's why rapamycin improves longevity. Uh, as I said, um, it's from Easter Island, cute little statues. Uh, we use it in today's medicine world. We use it for cancer therapy. We use it for immune suppression after kidney transplants. And they use it in drug-eluting stents. Uh, they use it because it, uh, if you have a stent in your blood vessel and it becomes fibrotic, the stent's not useful anymore. So it blocks fibrosis. So, rapamycin should be a really good thing. And in fact, it does have phenomenal qualities, right? Uh, stem cell loss is delayed, cognitive decline, heart failure, liver, tendons, physical activity. Sounds phenomenal. 
It's not exactly as phenomenal as, uh, as people want you to think. At high doses, which is what you need for actual medical treatments, it's got some nasty side effects. Um, and so I always talk about the pro cons and do no harm as a doctor. I think it's pretty terrible. Um, number one, you are truly immunosuppressed, so you are very likely to have uh, other infections, which is bad. Um, people become edematous, mouth ulcers, alopecia, testicular issues, infertility. It's not a good thing. People tell, will, will tell you now that with lower doses, these things are less likely to occur. And that may be true. Jury's still out. My concern, however, is there is two sets of cells that you really don't want to turn off. One of them is in the hippocampus because you want memories. And number two is if you don't have muscle turnover, you become sarcopenic, neither of which are very good things in my book. Um, so this is just a heck of a lot of quotes that I won't go through. The point being is that you lose memory, or the ability to form memories, especially fear memories, spatial memories, auditory memories, whole variety of memories. So before anyone jumps on the rapamycin bandwagon, I would just be forewarning that it's not all it's cracked up to be. Uh, secondly, sarcopenia. Um, this is obviously, it's muscle wasting, occurs over time, especially with age. Um, Many, many people I bet in this audience are on uh, glucophage, right? Metformin, everybody? Right, so metformin is a partial mTOR inhibitor. You will notice that people have, that have been on it for a little while, in fact, become sarcopenic. That's just what it does. So as a side uh, note, I will tell you that you need to take either branched chain amino acids or leucine because that way you can prevent the sarcopenia that comes with partial inhibition. If you have full inhibition, I don't know if it'll work anymore. Leucine. There's three branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and proline? Valine. Thank you, valine. But they come either as BCAAs or the only really one that's important is leucine. All right, tenant four. Um, we are not going to, well, so there's four DNA repair mechanisms. There are four protein repair mechanisms for just to save a little time, I wasn't going to talk about the protein ones anyway. We'll try to like, get through the DNA ones reasonably quickly. But why is DNA repair important? Well, it's incredibly important because in every cell, every day, in terms of single strand breaks, there are between five to 10,000 problems, right? Double standard breaks, somewhere between 10 to 20 per day. Doesn't seem like a lot, but. Uh, you add in substitutions, deletions, and all sorts of other DNA errors, and in total, you get 10 to the fifth DNA errors per cell per day. That's a boatload of problems. If you don't fix them, you're kind of screwed. Like in the vernacular. Why do we have this? Because you get stress from everywhere. Free radicals, um, radiation, mechanical stress. Anytime you process your DNA, you're gonna have problems. So, how do we repair a DNA? There's two steps. Step one is called identify the problem. Step two is send in the appropriate fix-it mechanism. We identify a problem with a PARP. There are 17 PARPs. The only one we really care about for this is PARP1. I didn't know how much detail you guys wanted, so I didn't stick it on there. Um, but basically what a PARP does is it locates a problem, figures out what calvary to call, and then it takes apart nicotinamide molecules, makes a big chain, and then uses that to fill the defect in the DNA. So depending on what that defect is, if it's a single strand, wow, these slides just didn't travel well, did they? Uh, single, if it's a single uh, side, then it's either a base excision repair or a nucleotide excision repair. If it's double-stranded, then you get uh, group two, which are the recombinations, either homogenous or non-homogenous. We don't need details. Why does DNA damage cause aging? Because DNA causes senescent cells. What's a senescent cell? It is an old, grumpy, useless, obnoxious cell, right? Think of the old grumpy guy at work in the corner. All he does is spew out obnoxiousness and cause toxins everywhere. That's what a senescent cell does. Puts out interleukins, drives everybody nuts. Uh, that causes chronic inflammation and ultimately it causes cancer and other issues with the degeneration. Security. Your security system, that's your immune system and it's the inflammatory cascade. Over time, your body is in a chronic state of inflammation. That is no good. Your infection risk goes up. That is no good. And you get increased cancers, especially from the bone marrow, which are lymphomas and leukemias. Again, no good. Inflammation is so bad when you're aging, it even has its own word, right? Inflammaging, you guys have heard this? No? Well, you have now. 
Uh, infection risk. None of the cells that do all these things work as well as they used to. So you get ro ro the last, excuse me, less robust production of the cells, and the cells that you do make just do not function as well. Uh, and any vaccines that you give to older people do not work as well. You've heard a grandma gets her flu vaccine and still gets the flu, right? Just not as efficacious. All right, 10 at 6, the workforce. These are your individual cells. And I'm going to try to breeze through this because I know it's uh, burning out of time. I have important things to tell you in a little bit. Um, but basically, the workforce is divided into how long your cells live. Some are very short, some are medium, and some are long. Do, 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 do. The short-lived ones, hours to days. Red blood cells live like three months. Your GI tract cells live one to four days. Uh, your red blood cell or your uh, white blood cells live between five and 60 hours. These are live hard, die fast cells. Medium cells, I call them the Goldilocks, not too long, not too short. These are bone, liver, kidney, that's roughly about eight to 10 years. And then the long-lived cells, your stem cells live hopefully your whole life, and your neurons hopefully your whole life, except for a few in the hippocampus. Interestingly, the cells in your, in your eye lens and the bones in your ears never turn over. So if you, if you screw them up, you're kind of screwed for life. Uh, again, short-lived, middle-aged, long, we're gonna skip over that. Waste management, one of my favorite subjects. Um, you got to take out the garbage, right? So in this case, what is cellular garbage? Well, the first thing we talk about is glucose. Glucose is bad. Um, we had this discussion at dinner, actually. I, don't, I love glucose, so I will do anything in my power to be able to consume it and just cheat the system. Other people just prefer not to eat it. Doesn't really matter. But what, why is glucose bad? Because glucose and oxidative stress cause advanced glycation end products. These are AGEs. We've heard of this, right? Right? And there's receptors on cells, rages, that get activated and cause inflammation. Um, to go from glucose to an age is about a seven step process. And the good news is we have blockers that can stop pretty much all of those steps, if you know what they are. Um, if glucose binds with uh, protein, it's an AGE. If it's a lipid, it's an ALE. Likewise, DNA becomes a DNA AGE. It's not quite as much fun. Um, these things call it, cause severe inflammatory processes number one. Number two, they're very sticky. I like to tell people that glucose is sticky on the outside, it's sticky on the inside. And it breaks anything that's collagen based. Uh, the example I like to tell people, if you look at like a, a napkin or a piece of cloth and you see interwoven fibers, if you put a piece of super glue on it and then you try to move the fiber, they break, right? That's what's happening in your skin. That's why your skin ages over time. Because all the glucose and then the motion breaks your collagen. Collagen turns over every 17 years, so it's really hard to get that back. The good news is you can strip your collagen, which is what I do all the time. Uh, the other thing is that when glucose is stuck to something, you lose the functionality of that protein. Okay, this is the last thing to talk about. You guys know what lipofusion is? Okay, so every time you reformat your cells, right? That's, that's a bad word. Every time you turn over your organelles, mitochondrial turnover, Golgi body turnover, every time you recycle, your body takes out, or the cells take out pieces to recycle, but there's always this remnant garbage that it just doesn't know what to do with. Um, does everyone here have a kitchen drawer that's stuffed with crap? Yes. All right, so that's what lipofusion is. It's the crap that your cell doesn't know what to do with, squashes it in the back of the cell, and pretends that no one's gonna notice, right? And no one does notice until you get pretty old. And this is a big problem in neurons. Neurons are filled with lipofusion. If you look, if you cut open the brain of a 90 year old, and we've done this, it's kind of cool, 90% um, of these cells are stuffed with lipofusion. Thus, it's, you know, it's just, you just can't think. It's a, it's a problem. And, but it's interesting, it's not just us that this happens to, it happens to crustaceans. In fact, this is the way they, they age lobsters. You can count, you can look, look in their cells, look at their lipofusion, and it's how you, lay, how you age all sorts of lobsters and stuff, which is why it's my cute little lobster there. Anyway, so summation of aging, DNA, energy, pathways, quality control, security, workforce, waste management. I may not have everything that we know about aging yet in this list, but I would guess that if something pops up, it will fit into one of these categories. So it's sort of a work in progress. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears. I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do about this, okay? This is the fun part. I love this part. So this is a stereotypical proto chart, prototypical chart that I would make for somebody. And it looks kind of crazy, but I'm gonna explain it to you so that it makes sense. 
So the first thing you need to know is across the top, where it says tenant one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, those are the categories we just talked about. Right? So that should all be kind of familiar now, right? And just in case people forget, I wrote it down. DNA, mitochondria, blah, 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 blah. On the far side, there's a bunch of molecular agents there. And I call them molecular agents because sometimes things are adjuvants, and sometimes they're supplements, and sometimes they fall into other categories. But what are they really? They're acting on a molecular basis, so I call them molecular agents. Uh, so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna look at two of these quickly and tell you how I score them to, so that you know how to make up your own program. All right, so we're gonna look at astaxanthin first. Are you guys familiar with astaxanthin? Yeah. Okay, good, so I don't have to go through the whole, the whole nine yards. Um, the goofy number underneath of it that I call the Kaufman rating number is simply because I rated it. <laughs> Someday I will be not so famous for that, but that's my plan. So what does this number mean? If it's a zero, it does nothing in the first, well, actually, so you guys understand there's seven numbers there, right? They correspond, of course, to the seven categories. If it's a got a zero in that category, did absolutely nothing. I searched, every, I searched everywhere, high and low, every research place I could find. I, I spent years doing this. Got a zero, there's nothing, right? Best it can do is a three. It means there's human evidence, efficacious, fabulous, does a great job. If it's a one and a two, somewhere in between, okay? So if you look at this, you'll notice that it does nothing in the first category. And in the second category, which is mitochondria, it rocks, right? Further down, you notice that there's a two. Rocks in that category as well. So, oh, we can skip this because you guys know it's the red stuff and all the marine world, blah, 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 blah. If you're ordering salmon, get it red because it's got more astaxanthin in it. All right, so, that was a small aside. <laughs> if you go to the grocery store and it says um, artificially flavored, it means they fed the fish astaxanthin. It's cheaper and it's better for you. Little tidbit. Uh, okay, so tenant two. We talked about it. mitochondria, it rocks. It is an incredible free radical scavenger. Uh, it recycles in your body every 24 hours in the cell membrane, the outside cell membrane, as well as the mitochondrial membrane. As well, it also uh, increases your own endogenous production of uh, scavengers. So this stuff is phenomenal and there's absolutely no side effects. That's category uh, two. And then category five, it's phenomenal in the immune system. Reduces uh, nuclear factor kappa beta, which then suppresses all the interleukins, which is pretty amazing. It's a COX-2 inhibitor, which is pretty cool because the rest of them were taken off the market for cardiovascular disease several years ago. Uh, blah, 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 blah. What does it do clinically? Oh, it's so cool. Japanese love astaxanthin. Every culture has their own particular thing that they like. Japanese love this. There's so many Japanese astaxanthin studies, it's great. Anyway, in 2009, they gave, uh, was it, six milligrams to uh, a bunch of people for one month. 60% had better vision. That's pretty damn cool, right? Skin, if you slather the stuff on your skin, you look younger. You just do. You look a little orange sometimes, but <laughs> small price to pay, right? In terms of fitness, it increases your exercise capacity. I give this stuff to rock climbers and they love me forever. It's amazing. Uh, it also decreases the DNA, the DNA and protein damage that comes with exercise and it prevents the free radicals that you accumulate with, with uh, exercise. Because if you exercise, you're using up more oxygen, you get more free radicals. That's why some researchers are lazy schmucks and they're like, oh, I wouldn't want more free radicals. Eh, but it's a solvable problem. All right, the only other one I'm gonna talk about is carnosine because it's my absolute favorite. Um, Again, now you will see that the KRN is the Kaufman rating number, right? Now we're all got the lingo going. Useful in two categories, as you can see. The key here is that one of the categories is the same, but the last one isn't. Because different agents have different properties. Right? Carnosine's kind of cool. It's a dipeptide. It's present in all muscle. All animals have it. There are three forms. We only have one. I don't know why. The amino acids come from your diet, especially chicken. Uh, the whole like uh, eat chicken soup when you're sick works because of carnosine. If you're a vegetarian, you better take some carnosine because there isn't any in vegetables. Um, the amount varies with your age and your gender. If you are younger, you have more. And if you're a guy, you have more, which I never thought was fair. Um, this is the coolest experiment ever. If you take human fibroblasts that are old and grumpy and you put them in a bath of carnosine, they become juvenile again. It's the coolest thing in the world. This was described by a bunch of Australian scientists. 
blanket on the year now. Uh, I'll come up with it in a minute. Anyway, if you take the cells out of the bath, they become old. You put them back in the bath, they become young again. So in fact, carnosine can make cells live longer and better, and the study demonstrated that you can increase their turnover or increase the ability to turn over by dividing by 25%. So that's pretty damn cool. So carnosine. Second tenet, uh, mitochondria does pretty much the same thing that astaxanthin does. Waste management, for this one is particularly important because it blocks AGE production. There's that nasty stuff that ruins your skin from the glucose, you can block it, which is pretty darn cool. Some evidence that you can even reverse it. Not going out on a limb on that one, but there is some evidence that it can. Uh, clinically, if you are on carnosine and you go to lots of lo uh, loud rock concerts, it'll protect your hearing. I give it to my kids because she plays in a rock band. Um, if you take it via eye drops, you can reverse presbyopia. Presbyopia, the inability to see up close, that is glycation of your lens, makes it more stiff. By reversing the glycation, you can read again without glasses. I know, ooh, right? Um, makes your skin better too. All right, so I have rated 30 some agents in this manner. It took me a hell of a long time to do. But there it is, and it's kind of blurry so that you guys can't cheat and steal it. I'm kidding, I don't care. I'll mail it to anybody, I don't really care. Point being is that there are a lot of options out there, and everyone here is on a different protocol, and that's okay. But you need to be on a smart protocol, right? It's really dumb to peak, take seven things in one category and nothing in another. So based on the numbering system, and this is what this is now, you take your agents, you line them up, and you count the numbers. Right? And several things, like you ask yourself, okay, well, how avidly do I want to pursue this? Well, that will tell you how many numbers you want at the bottom. And you will need a balanced list. So this is a pretty generic list that I've given to someone. And several things, there's, there's stuff in every category, so that's balanced. But if someone were to say, well, what else should I take? I would say, well, you know what? Category six is a little bit lower than the rest of them. So if I was gonna add something to this, I'd go with something for that. The idea is a balanced approach. All right, so I have had, I don't know, dozens, dozens, I don't know, I've lost track of people on my protocol, uh, and I've gotten tremendous feedback. Uh, my rock climbing partner is one of my first victims ever. <laughs> he likes to think of him as my, my king guinea pig. Um, people have higher energy levels. No one gets sick anymore. I work in a kiddie hospital. Everyone's like, it's like living in an auger plate. No one gets sick. It's pretty impressive. People's hair is better. Their skin is better. Their vision is better. They don't worry about the weight anymore. It just drops off. People say their joints don't hurt anymore. It's really cool. And, that, you know, even better, people say their sex lives are better. It's got to be a good thing, right? So how do you choose a protocol? Well, hopefully I've given you the tools to do this yourself. When people come to me, I say, well, how old are you? Do you have any medical issues? And how avidly do you want to uh, pursue this? Because you're different at different ages. We all like to pretend that we're all the same, but we're not. When you're 35, you got DNA damage to worry about. You've got epigenetics to worry about. When you're about 40, you start losing your endogenous antioxidants. That's a problem, right? Your sirtuin levels start declining. Your vision starts going, and you get fat, right? When you're 90, when you're 90 maybe you're no longer preventing stuff, but now you've got a whole boatload of things to treat. But it's certainly plausible to do. My favorite medical condition, diabetes, I tell all of these people they just need to fix their AGEs. That's the biggest problem. So when I make a protocol for people with diabetes, I load waste management. People that have inflammatory issues, I, I, I load the security system. So depending on what people's problems are, as well as aging, we load that category. People love this. Uh, again, age, lifestyle choices, degree of commitment. Um, so what normally happens is people go, oh, can I come to your office? And the answer is no. Um, I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist. You guys are now officially disqualified. You're not pediatrics. Um, that being said, there is a book. explains all of this. Uh, I would suggest reading it with a magic marker and, or a highlighter because there's a heck of a lot of information in there. Um, if you want the cheat version, you can go to the website. If you really don't give a rat's ass about why it works and you just want a protocol, you can download the app. The app will ask you what you want to do and it'll tell you what to take. And then it tracks your progress, so that's kind of fun. Um, lastly, you can just give up and ask me. That's, that works too. <laughs> I have a lot of emails every day. Uh, let's see, citations, citations, questions. I made it to the end.
so. We have time for some questions. Maybe Brittany will help me. It's probably too overwhelming, right? Too much stuff. Uh, so, so one question is, is how do you, you, you said, well, which areas, which of those tenant areas do you want to focus on or do you need to build up? How do you determine that? Is that something you, is that, how do you determine that? Like if I, if I was, if you were to ask me that, how would I, how, how would I know the answers to that? So most disease processes are a failure of one of those departments. And whereas you might not know what it is, I do. Based on some condition that someone has? Yeah, exactly. So neurogenerative stuff tends to be repair mechanisms from the progeriard syndromes where people get old really fast. Um, if people have particular issues with skin, if you can look at their skin, you can tell if it's an AGE problem or a life effusion accumulation problem. Um, clearly the diabetes is the easiest example, which is why I use it. But usually every disease falls into one of these problem categories. So it's based on sort of symptoms and yeah. conditions. And if it doesn't, then we just give you a balanced uh, program. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, amazing, first of all. Um, protocol is based mostly on supplementation, or is there like lifestyle choices, exercise, I mean, is there other things that So you missed the first slide. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so the answer is, I don't want to tell anyone what to eat and to exercise. Obviously, what you eat is very important, and a lot of foods fall into epigenetic categories. Uh, on the app, there's a whole list of them so that people sort of get credit sort of for, for, for eating the right thing. But the idea is... I want anyone to be able to do this. I don't want people to say, oh my God, I have to really change my diet. I really have to do X, Y, or Z. I can tell you that I, I, I rated, I put exercise, both endurance and resistance, the same testing that I put everything else through, and I rated it. And it, there's, So there's a number to it, um, so that if you do do it, and you're on the app, and you enter it, the, 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 the points sort of like pop up. Um, but I, I don't really want to tell anyone what to do in terms of their life. I can just tell you how to make your cells better. And so the answer is yes, it's all, it's all supplements and adjuvants because it's all molecular manipulation. Cool, thank you. Uh, you mentioned something very quickly about how you increase your collagen. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so collagen turns over every 17 years. Hyaluronic acid turns over every 24 hours. And I decided that my next book is going to be, I'm going to do exactly the same thing for skin because it's so cool. Um, you can increase collagen deposition by actually eating the pieces of, 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 of collagen. You, you, can, you can eat it and it does in fact end up in your skin because they've, they've done studies demonstrating this. Um, the other thing you need to do for your collagen is when the sun hits you, it turns on things called MMPs and they dissolve your collagen. So the other thing that you need to slather on your skin are MMP inhibitors. Or you can eat them as well, depending on how old your skin is, depending on the ret line and the vascularization, blah, blah, blah. So I end up making my own skincare stuff, and I put MMP inhibitors in there to protect my collagen, and I consume collagen. And hyaluronic acid. Excuse me? You know what, there is, and I don't know what the name is, but I can, I can send it out to anyone that wants to know. Absolutely. I, I have a question. Yeah, hi. Hi, <laughs> yeah. You were awesome, I Thank loved you. it. So I have a, kind of a, a two-on question. In regards to ages, you talked about glucose levels. Are you referring just to blood glucose levels, or are you referring to just not eating sugar at all from that standpoint? That's my first well, question. Well, everyone has some aspect of sugar in them. Right. Right. Um, some people try to minimize that. Other people could care less. That would be me. Um, the, the, the key is how you process the glucose. Right. Okay. Right? Yes. So clearly the less you eat, the less you have to worry about it. Right. If you do consume it, there are ways to manipulate it. For example, if you take metformin, you are reducing the absorption of glucose. Right. Uh, there are other things you can take to reduce the reactivity of, of glucose. Mm -hmm. There are things you can do to block AGE production, and then there are things you can do to strip AGEs. Right. I go on what I call Harataki holidays, where I take a lot of chibulic acid over the course of 48 hours. I do it once a month, and I think, you know, I have no way of testing it at the moment. 
but theoretically, if I were a mouse, I should be stripping all of my collagen of AEG products. And the reason it's important is, number one, your skin looks better, but it's also all of your <coughs> organs are collagen-based. So people wouldn't say, oh, I got old and I got heart failure, and they don't have cardiovascular disease. It's because their collagen is failing just over time from AGEs. Correct. OK. And then I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. Yes and no. More or less, just want with the, the, blue, the blood glucose level, because you said glucose level, so I just wanted right. to, well, no, it's if your, somebody would right, be so it's in your blood, them. right? Yeah. I mean, that's right. And it goes up and down, theoretically controlled with your insulin levels, et cetera. Right. But the real thing that you want to measure is hemoglobin A1C, because it gives you a three to four month look at how, much, how you're doing. Perfect. Um, last but, question, just as a follow-up in regards to that, is they have also, just based off of research, that the depending on how you actually cook your food could be worse in regards to developing or creating ages in the body, especially on how you cook your meat. Oh, that's absolutely true. Okay. There is so an entire giant section in my book about that. Right. Um, and it does. It tells you how to, how to cook things, how not to cook things. Right. The slower, lower temperatures are better. Um, I, yes. Okay. You're, you're absolutely correct. Two-thirds of the AGEs in your body actually come from, from food and or smoking. Um, and you, I forget exactly the percentage of what sticks and what doesn't stick, but you can get rid of those in the same way that you get rid of your own endogenous ones. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, how do you treat your uh, connective tissue? So connective tissue is what we were talking about. It's all collagen based. It's the collagen. It's all collagen based. So, so the answer is you eat collagen, you take hyaluronic acid, oh, yeah. you, you block the MMP inhibitors, and you block the ages. And when you said it about the sugar, if you eat bread, it became sugar in the body. So it's the same? It's the same thing. Okay, thank you. Over here. When you had the uh, rapamycin slides up, you mentioned metformin real quick, uh -huh. but I missed your point regarding that in, that in that moment. Why did you mention metformin? Oh, because metformin is a partial mTOR inhibitor. So it's, it's sort of like taking rapamycin watered down. My point is that everyone is on the rapamycin bandwagon right now. At RADFest, everyone was like pushing to take rapamycin. I thought, I don't think that's a great idea. Um, I think partial blockage of rapamycin, of, of, of mTOR is okay, and we all do that through uh, metformin anyway. So I think that the rapamycin is just sort of crosses the line into you're doing harm when we're trying not to do harm. But my point is, that, is they both cause sarcopenia and we can partially reverse it with uh, leucine. Anyone else? Yes, sir, ma'am. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, there's a patented form of niacinamide out there called NR, or uh, uh, I'm blanking on it right yeah, now. Nicotinamide riboside. Uh, yeah, niagen is the uh, yeah. substance I'm thinking of. Could, uh, could you speak about that at all? It seems to be pretty trendy at the moment. Well, <laughs> right, so the only ones on the market right now that I am aware of, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's absolutely true, is nicotinamide riboside or the mono, mononucleoside? Right? Um, all the studies right now are on NR. So that's the one I take. Um, you can't measure your own levels at the moment. I tell people to do it by energy levels. Um, I think that if you bullish yourself up after the age of 45 and your energy levels perk up, then you can back off a bit. There's no evidence that having a lot is necessarily good for you. You want medium amounts. You just want to not be deficient. Um, in terms of which is better, I have no idea. Um, but I also don't think that these infusions are a great idea. I've worked in a hospital a really long time, and no one has ever come in with a stat nicotinamide deficiency. I mean, I, so I just don't necessarily know if the IV is necessary, but definitely you need to replete it, and I think at the moment, niagen's the best way to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, a lot of us have hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. so can you address that? The problem with hypothyroidism sort of depends on why you're hypothyroid. Uh, there, there are very, there's a wide range of reasons. If you are recently hypothyroid from cellular failure, there is a chance that you can fix it once you get your cells revved up. It is, if it is a mu immune problem and you've destroyed your thyroid, then you can't. Um, so it depends on length of time and etiology. Like, I can't fix a problem that's been going on for 40 years. 
Um, but some hormones that sort of start failing are secondary to cell failure with age, and those we can theoretically reverse. So take your, take your Synthroid. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Awesome. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, everybody. Great job. Okay, so just a little bit of just a little little bit of data to take in there, <laughs> right? Just it just yeah, it just filled in a couple gaps for me, just a couple things. But we're not done yet because we have one of our favorite, often traveling, shh, shh, the power of shh. I'll write the book. I could write the book on the power of shh. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have a, one of our favorite often traveling members of People Unlimited here to give us an update on what he's been up to, Dr. Bill Andrews. <laughs> One of my greatest pleasures in life is coming to this, these meetings and speaking. I, I, there's nothing like this anywhere. Um, just, I want to start off with not talking about my background. I just want to talk about Sandy's talk just now. I mean, that, her book, everybody's got to go to Amazon.com, or you actually showed a different site. Where they, so Amazon.com and buy this book because there's nothing like it. Okay. Now, she was at RadFest, and I was so busy at RadFest, I hardly had a time to even introduce myself, talk to her for maybe a total of five minutes on two occasions. But I took her book, and I read it, and it blew me away. I have never seen any book like this. Okay? It's, if you want a formula for what to do, you know, who, who here wonders, should I take this or shouldn't I take this? You know, we all do. Okay? It's, this book tells you, and I, I'm going to tell you, I've changed a lot about how I do my med medications and supplements and adjuvants, which is a key word. Adjuvant, is, supplements are things you take that are already in your body. You're just adding, oh wait, I got it backward. Yes, adjuvants are the, okay, she better tell you. Tell you. <laughs> Adju supp not everything, supplements aren't everything. Some, some are called adjuvants, and how do I do this? Okay, adjuvants are things that you don't have your, you don't have in your body. Okay, good. I thought I said that the first time. Okay, so maybe I said it wrong. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I, I definitely recommend the book. As I said, I've read books from a lot of different people writing about this kind of stuff, and I've never seen a book like this one. So, and I think <laughs> now her book's about that thick. Okay. If she was able to, if she wrote the same stuff about exercise and diet. Okay, so she's probably going to come out with books later on something like that. Um, I wanted to give an update on what's going on with the lengthening telomeres. Um, and since everybody already knows about telomeres, uh, there's no point in going over those. Um, I do want to say that we've built quite a big team of people that are involved in the clinical study that we're trying to put on to lengthen telomeres. Uh, Sandy is now on that team, and she's actually been a major force in rewriting the protocol for especially figuring out what kind of markers. So, you know, her book's being actually employed into this thing, and she's, she and I talk like three times a day. Uh, she's on opposite sides of the country from me, but we're talking three times a day about getting this clinical, clinical protocol done. Now, <clears throat> why is it taking so long? Okay. Uh, there, there is a tremendous. <laughs> imagine, imagine you're in a hospital surgery room, uh, and you're doing a heart transplant, and everybody's got all their parts, and everybody's doing everything, and you get another point, and you take the heart out, and somebody says, "Okay, where's the other heart?" 
nobody remember to get the other heart. Okay, it, it, it's, this is a scary kind of experience, especially when you're responsible. Okay, so we are having to go through this protocol and make certain every step is there. So when, when doctors start to actually treat the patient and they start taking what are called pre-test and then later post-test, uh, they gotta know exactly what, there's gotta be a step-by-step -step instructions on what to do. And like when you take the blood sample out of a pr patient, where do you send it? Who's gonna test it? This is incredi incredible amount of work and plus there can be so many errors like forgetting to get the heart where the person, the patient could end up dying because we didn't plan it well enough. Okay, so this is turning out to be a major part of this clinical protocol, just trying to get the protocol written. And Sandy can tell you, she and I have been just on conference calls, talking to just one another, just trying to get this all figured out. Uh, and the team gets, keeps getting bigger because we keep having to add new people to the team when we find deficiencies. Uh, and then, like even just yesterday, I was driving to work and I went into a panic. I thought, oh my God, we don't have any step figured out for step such and such. You know, and so I get to work and I start talking to my scientists, we gotta get this going and so, and so we're working on that. But that's, that's why it's taking so long. We can't seem to get it perfected to my and other people's satisfaction, okay? And as soon as it's ready, then we're gonna treat the first patient. First patient is scheduled for uh, mid-January. Um, <clears throat> we actually have hospitals all over the uh, world competing to who's going to be that hospital where that person gets treated, and that includes in the United States. Uh, and so things things can happen soon, and I just can't wait. I mean, I'm I'm in this because of me. You know, I'm like you all. I want to live healthy as long as I can and I think this is going to be a major step towards doing it but I don't want to discourage everything else because so many other things are important too uh, and uh, but this is definitely one part of it and thank you very much for having me back again and as I say every time is where have you been all my life <laughs>